Okay, everyone, I'd like to uh, call our meeting to order, and uh, I'll apologize to our faithful watchers out there uh, regarding our delays. We had a few issues that were beyond our control, and uh, I guess a fire drill that uh, occurred unexpectedly. And uh, I'd like to welcome everybody here to our Standing Committee of Natural Resources and Environmental Sustainability. And uh, I, I, always, I like to try to give an outline of what our objectives are. The Standing Committee of Natural Resources and Environmental Sustainability is charged with matters concerning agriculture, fisheries, land, water, forest, wildlife, energy, natural resources, environment, climate change, and other such matters relating to natural resources and environment sustainability. And uh, today we have uh, Bill Lawler here uh, representing uh, Red Cross. And I guess you might ask why Red Cross and, and this particular committee and I guess it was brought forward by a number of committee members. We had a number of people in the aquaculture industry, the forestry industry, and livestock sector, and farm community that identified delays and issues pertaining to uh, their claims from the Fiona disaster relief. And uh, that's the rationale behind why we've asked uh, Red Cross to represent here. And. Uh, I also want to thank Alicia here. We had a busy day today. We've uh, had a, our unofficial uh, tour of the Atlantic Beef Products Plant in Borden, and uh, that made for a bit of a rush to get through that and get back here for uh, 2 p.m., but we, we met the deadline, but then the fire alarm went off. So, uh, so anyway, I'm Robert Henderson. I'm the chair of the committee, and uh, today we have with us uh, Carla Bernard, Peter Bevan Baker, uh, Jamie Fox, and Hilton McLennan. And filling in, if Gordon McNeely shows up, he's filling in for Hal Perry. And we have two associate members here, Brad Trivers and Susie Dillon. So without further ado, I'm going to ask uh, our speaker, our, our presenter, to uh, identify themselves for uh, Hansard. I believe you might have somebody coming to, as well with you to support. Uh... On the oh, on the screen. There we are. Good. Sorry about that. Uh, so anyway, I'll, I'll uh, introduce you, Bill, and you can take it from there, and then we'll open up for questions. I do have uh, one request. Uh, Jamie Foxx has requested uh, if uh, he's got a little tighter timeline, we might uh, go to him first on a question. But uh, we'll see how this goes, okay? And I'll just play that by ear as chair. Okay, Bill Lawler, take it away. All right on. Uh, Bill Lawler, uh, Interim Vice President for the Canadian Red Cross here in Atlantic Canada. Uh, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, uh, on behalf of the Canadian Red Cross, I want to thank you for the opportunity uh, to be here today. Uh, we're aware of some of the questions that resulted as a part of the previous meetings uh, within the committee. Um, as sev several of you uh, will recall, uh, we, were, we were here almost a year ago today, in fact, uh, on the well, previous uh, activities within Hurricane Fiona response uh, to provide a briefing over that initial phase of the response and to an answer your questions that you were certainly asking on behalf of uh, your constituents. We appreciate the opportunity for this overview uh, to provide, uh, as we continue to provide, rather support during the recovery phase for the exact same event, that being Hurricane Fiona, and to answer any and all questions that you may have. Uh, to begin from the Canadian Red Cross, I'd like to acknowledge that the land on which we gather is the traditional and unceded territory of the Epiquet Mi'kmaq First Nations people. I'd also like to introduce you to my colleague, Emily Pietropalo, our Vice President of Recovery Services. Emily is joining me virtually from the ter traditional territory, pardon me, of the Mississaugas of the Credit. Emily is considered to be our resident expert on all things recovery, including administering disaster financial assistance programs on behalf of governments. And she brings 17 years of experience to this conversation. As mentioned, my name is Bill Aller, um, with, with the Red Cross for 25 years now, uh, predominantly in the, in the realm of uh, emergency management and, and some of other of our programs um, as well. Uh, I want to also assure you that the Canadian Red Cross continues to be here in PEI as we support those impacted by Fiona, some of which Mr. Chair mentioned, uh, and others as, in terms of individuals as well, individual household impact. We also continue to prepare for the eventuality of the next major event to occur, and although we hope it's not for quite some time, we continue our readiness efforts here within the province. Since the beginning of the Fiona response, the Red Cross has been actively engaged across Atlantic Canada, and specifically here in PEI, which is, as you know, amongst the hardest hit in the region. Recently, we conducted a survey specifically to Hurricane Fiona uh, throughout the Atlantic region, and over 86% of the respondents from PEI had identified as having received Red Cross assistance compared to only 14% of respondents in Newfoundland and 12% in Nova Scotia 
And that speaks also to the, the impact within those very you know, specific provinces. In addition to this, the scope and the scale of the need to support islanders was clear. 48% of respondents from PEI identified as being affected by Hurricane Fiona either completely or majorly, while only 1% of respondents identified as not being impacted at all. In the early days of our response, as you know, as we, we covered last time, uh, our efforts focused on the shelter, the registration, and of course, the, the Mass Financial Assistance Program. While we did support response efforts with our own monies during that time, where we delivered our own programming, followed by Red Cross standards, as well as on behalf of the province of Prince Edward Island, today's meeting, from our perspective, and, and again, following the previous meeting, which led to this invitation, is to focus on the recovery and the government of Prince Edward Island's Disaster Financial Assistance Program and our role in administering that program. Before I hand it over to my colleague, Emily, to speak to the DFA program, I'd like to reiterate that Red Cross remains committed to working with the local and provincial authorities here on the island. Thankfully, Hurricanes Lee and Philippe resulted in minimal impacts here on the island and throughout the region, but as both of those storms were approaching, we were in constant communication with PEI-EMO until such time that it was determined there was no need for our level of engagement. I'll now pass it over to Emily for some further overview. Thanks, Bill. Um, as Bill noted earlier, in addition to work funded separately through the Canadian Red Cross, we've been contracted by the government of PEI to administer the province's Disaster Financial Assistance Program, or DFA. The Red Cross has extensive experience administering similar programs across the country and working in recovery, including the administration of DFA on behalf of the provincial government in response to Hurricane Dorian in 2019. We also have a long history of operating programming to support impacted households, small businesses, and not-for-profit organizations after disasters. Um, I'd like to focus on the specifics of the PEI DFA program in response to Hurricane Fiona. A total of 3,371 applications were submitted. As of October 13th, the Red Cross has processed 89% of all submitted applications to the program. This includes approved, ineligible, withdrawn, and duplicate applications. In total, so far, we have approved 900 applications with over $7.6 million approved, comprised of 5.4 million paid out and 2.2 million committed. Our local teams continue to work hard in the remaining 11% of applications that are not yet closed, which include ineligible and incomplete files. We're working to resolve them as soon as possible in close partnership with the governor, government of PEI. To get into a little bit more detail around those 11%, um, these may be applications that are being re-reviewed for eligibility following an escalation or an appeal. They may be more complex cases that require additional review and analysis. We might be waiting for a determination from federal authorities as it's ultimately a federal reimbursement program, or we may be waiting on documentation from the applicant themselves. In terms of the type of applications we've received, the vast majority of applications are residential, with most of them being applications regarding tree cleanup or removal. A small portion of residential applications are for homes with major damage. We've prioritized these applications and resolved as many as possible. In many of the ones that remain open, there is a dependency such as a damage assessment or an insurance determination before we're able to close the application. Of the 441 applications we received from small businesses, approximately 100 are from the aquaculture sector. To date, um, this effort has represented over 10,000 hours of staff time over the last year since the program launched. As a humanitarian organization, we know that assistance can never be fast enough. To provide some further context, I want to take you through two examples of the program complexity um, that is faced by applicants, the Red Cross, the government of PEI, as well as federal authorities. First, the challenges with the disaster financial assistance prog programming broadly. The federal reimbursement program is undergoing a reform due to increasingly severe events resulting in pan-Canadian programmatic challenges, many of which we're seeing manifest in PEI. The PEI program, like every province and territory, has to align to the federal disaster financial assistance program, which provides funding and sets the program parameters. While we work to administer the PEI program as quickly as possible, within the current constraints, the Red Cross has also been providing recommendations to the federal government on this and other programs in Canada to ensure that programs can be applied faster, 
to reduce documentation requirements and to allow for financial advances so those impacted are not paying out of pocket. To demonstrate this, the Pan-Canadian Disaster Financial Program to which PEI must align is based on insurability, not on loss and damage alone. To give you a few examples of the complexity and limitations of this, um, an applicant has to demonstrate that their losses were uninsurable, not just uninsured. These sort of sound like the same thing, but they're not. As islanders know all too well, Hurricane Fiona's impact on trees across the island was very severe. As stated earlier, most of the applications received from residential from residents for tree cleanup or removal. These applicants have had to provide confirmation that their insurance policies didn't cover tree cleanup or removal. And in the case of aquaculture, which is a unique industry, insurance is widely unavailable and very limited. Even if someone is insured, it's very challenging for applicants to quantify damage and loss, and it doesn't address lost opportunity or business. To be eligible to the program, and again, this is not a PEI-driven requirement, but a pan-Canadian one, Applicants are required to demonstrate, number one, that they could not have purchased insurance for that specific loss that they're claiming anywhere from any provider at any cost in order to be considered eligible. Number two, applicants have to submit a document that confirms this. So they essentially have to prove the absence of something, uh, which is very difficult. This is just one example of the challenge that Canada is facing that, again, is not specific to PEI and one that the Red Cross has made consistent advocacy around. To be clear, there are applications that won't be eligible because a homeowner elected not to purchase insurance for a home, despite it being readily available and affordable. That's a slightly different type of case. The second challenge we have with the disaster financial assistance programming broadly is that there are consistent pain points experienced by individuals, irrespective of if they're covered by insurance or government assistance programming. In all events across Canada, recovery is slower than all systems anticipate. And in our experience, it can take two to three years to fully rebuild. This is the case even if individuals impacted do everything right, have insurance, and do all the things they're supposed to do. Case files from Fort McMurray, Alberta, an event now over seven years ago, have only recently been closed due to some of the systemic challenges that are beyond any program, such as limited contractors, adjusters, and housing shortages, to name a few. These delayed recovery timelines have been confirmed in the recently released National Adaptation Strategy. The positive, and again, we know that assistance can never be fast enough, is that in PEI, we and the government of PEI are working faster than the national averages with almost 90% of applications arrest. Thank you for the opportunity to speak about the program in detail. I'm happy to take any specific questions on the program um, in the Q&A period. Um, and just before I turn it back to Bill, I just want to reiterate that despite the challenges of this program, we and the government of PEI are committed to resolving each individual application to maximize coverage. We remain committed to helping those affected in PEI and working through the last 11% of those complex cases, for example, to help demonstrate uninsurability or with the aquaculture industry to help quantify losses. Thanks again for the opportunity and I'll turn it back over to Bill. Thanks, uh, Emily. And just a, a few more closing remarks before we open it up. But you know, certainly here in Prince Edward Island, We've been coming to the aid of Islanders for decades for various events. Uh, thankfully, most of them have been smaller events uh, up until recently, of course, with Doreen, but certainly with, with Fiona. Uh, we hope that the, our appearance here today provides further insight and it helps to describe some of the issues and challenges that we're faced with um, in terms of, and everyone is faced with, I should add, uh, as we move through this modernization of the federal government's DFA program as described. As you've heard, it's a very technical program which involves several sectors, including the provincial and federal governments, the insurance sector, and in this case, the Canadian Red Cross. We welcome further questions and discussions and bear with us as Emily and I navigate back and forth and, and do our best to address your concerns. Mm. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, uh, Bill. Uh, I guess I did have one uh, request. Do, do, do you have any written submission at all to leave with us, or are we just going by the oral? Uh, given the, the shorter time that we had to, to be here today from the, the yeah. invite, we will uh, follow up. I'll follow up with the clerk, and we'll provide something for okay. your... Uh, Hopefully uh, that uh, uh, makes it easier for committee members to recognize. I want to start with Jamie Fox. I said he's got a little tighter timeline than, than the rest of us, so... Thanks, questions. Chair. I uh, appreciate both of you coming in. I also appreciate the work that the Red Cross has done over you know, the vast number of years that the Red Cross has been in existence and provided support around the world. Um, you said something when you first were talking, and uh, maybe I heard this wrong, but I want to clarify it. Did you make a statement that the impact of Fiona was minimal impact? No. 
Not at all. Okay. If, if I did, I misspoke. I, okay. No minimal impact to the island. No. Yeah, that, that's what I want to make sure. that. I thought, so what my question is around the, my understanding of what Red Cross did is you basically uh, administered the fund to help individuals and residents across the island as applied on a, I want to say a more personal context of a house, household, family, how they were, they were impacted, right? Yes. So along with that, Chair, um, I'm very curious in, did the Red Cross receive any um, reports or complaints or reports of damage from the farming and the fishing sector? And if you did, what did you do with the information when you received it of how the fishery and the agriculture was impacted? Sure. Just before I turn that over, to Emily, it just occurred to me the, when you talk about the minimal uh, comment yeah. that I made, it was that of all those that were surveyed and participated in the poll, one percent on the island had said that they had minimal impact. Okay. Okay. Yes. Okay. Important. Thank you, so, Emily. Do you want to address the uh, question of the other sectors that the member asked? Sure. So yes, we did receive. I mean, there were applications for sure from the farming industry and from the fishing sector and aquaculture. Um, for the farming, um, there was, as you know, the Ministry of Agriculture also launched their own program um, after Fiona, and so there were discussions um, had where um, they are adjudicating those files, so that all the farming ones were transferred to the Ministry of Agriculture to adjudicate. And then for fishing and aquaculture, I think for us, we've just kept in touch with the MO and also with the Ministry of Aquaculture. Um, I know it's called something else, tourism, I think, um, sports culture, et cetera. And so we've worked really closely with them to understand what the impact is, um, what the insurability is, um, you know, how we can support the producers, recognizing that it's an industry that is widely uninsurable. Um, and making sure that um, they understand, you know, the application process and how to submit the application, et cetera. So we have just essentially just worked really closely with EMO and other departments um, when we've received those applications in. Jamie, do you have a follow-up Just follow up with that. Can you provide the committee with how many complaints or reports of damage or reports of lost that you received in regards to the agriculture and the fishery and aquaculture groups or sectors? Can you provide any any information to the committee at a later date um, of, of actually how many complaints and stuff you received? Remember, you were talk referring to applications that reported well, disaster? Because the complaints it, uh, is a little different than that. Than well, I just want to clarify that. Yeah. Speaker, it, it would have because I'll assume that if you put an application in, you might have a complaint later. But mm. if if you just have a complaint, how many? It's relevant, I guess it'd be how fine. many? How many reports? How many reports of impacts to the agriculture and the fishery and the aquaculture sector? So it's somebody not the same as application, application, okay. whatever you want to call it. There you go. Can you provide that Emily? information? Yeah, we can provide that at a later date. I don't know the numbers offhand, but we can go through. So we had the 3,371 applications, and we certainly have the numbers of how many were from agriculture and how many were from aquaculture and fisheries. So we can provide that later on. Thanks for now. Did you have a second question? Nope, that's so fine for now. You're good for now? Yep. Okay. Peter yep. Bevan Baker. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Bill. Thank you, Emily, for being uh, here this afternoon. Uh, I'm going to start with a couple of um, clarifications on numbers. Uh, 3,370 something applications received and 900 approved. And I realize that's not 100% of those, uh, of the 3,000, I think there's 11%, did you say, that are outstanding? Remaining, yes. Remaining, yes. right. So that's, uh, that's about a 25, 28% um, approval rating. Um, can you tell us whether that is sort of consistent with other situations where you've had disaster financial assistance plans like this? I'll lean on you, uh, Emily, with your experience with that. Sure. Um, so if I think back to Dorian, which was a significantly smaller program, we certainly still had a lot of people um, that were ineligible, although the impact was uh, less severe than Fiona. Um, in terms of uh, rates, I would say that yes, it is consistent um, because of, you know, when I spoke before about the insurability piece, that's the piece that tends to drive ineligibility um, often. And so that the, the main reason why people are not eligible for the program, I would say there's a multitude of reasons is really the ineligibility of around the insurance. 
Um, in other programs, we can't speak to other DFA programs um, because they're really owned by other provinces, but in terms of Red Cross programming, um, we, often, uh, we often can provide more flexibility in our own programming, but again, we're following this you know, pan-Canadian programmatic structure and working within the parameters that we have set out by um, the federal government. Peter Babbaker. Thank you, Chair. So just a couple of details on the structure of the program, and uh, as I understand it, um, the program was designed, and, and I, 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 well, maybe I need to start there just for my own, just to make sure I have things right here. We have our the PEI Disaster Financial Assistance Program. W was that designed by the Prince Edward Island government? Did, did they set the parameters, the criteria? So there's a bit of a, a hybrid here, and, and yep. Emily, I'll, I'll start and, and punt it over to you. Um, so. The, the, the criteria for, first of all, disaster financial assistance is a cost recovery program for provincial and territorial governments. In order to be eligible for that cost recovery, you have to meet the threshold and the criterion amongst the federal program. Um, so if at any time there is any tweaking to that at the local provincial level, then there's a narrative that needs to take place, a dialogue, if you will, between the provincial government and the federal government to determine whether or not that would be eligible for any type of cost recovery reimbursements. Uh, Emily, over to you if you want to add more further to that. Sure. So, um, the yes, yeah, so the, the PEI program is designed um, by the province of the government of PEI, but it has to be within the parameters of the federal or the pan Canadian disaster financial assistance arrangements, as they're called. Um, and so often, you know, as much as there are, um, you know, regional or contextual differences, they still have to fit within the overall parameters of that federally kind of set out um, set of guidelines. Peter Baker. Thanks. Thank you for, for that. And uh, so there are pan-Canadian guidelines and for the provincial program, which is designed by the provincial government, it must fit within the uh, criteria set by the federal government. One of the frustrations that I have that been brought to my attention by an, a number of constituents is the changing criteria here on Prince Edward Island um, in terms of the, not, not the um, insurability or lack thereof, but more regarding the timelines of eligibility and the maximum amount which is eligible. Who would, if changes were made, and, and they were on a number of occasions over the last year, to the criteria for the program provincially, who would make those changes? Bill Lawler? I'm going to turn that one over oh, to, uh, Emily? to Emily. Yeah. Um those any of the any eligibility or deadlines around the program or changes or extensions or anything like that um, really is a decision of the government of PEI and it's our job to take those and communicate them to applicants. Great. I'm, I'm really glad to have an unambiguous answer to that, Emily. Thank you. Um, so the province designed the program. R Canadian Red Cross administers it. And if changes are made, then the decisions on that are made by the provincial government. Um, I've had a few, fairly large number actually, of constituents in my district um, who have received, who have been denied, and then have appealed uh, their denial to. Uh, I can't think what the the board is. There's a there's an appeals board. Maybe that's what it's called. Can you tell us who sits on that appeals board? Peter Lawler, Peter Bill Lawler. No trouble. I'm going to again, my resident expert, Emily. Please uh, Peter, go ahead. Peter Battle. Sure. So the appeals process is that um, everyone has 30 days to appeal the decision, um, whether you know positive or negative decision in their view, and then um, within the Red Cross, we do an initial review of the appeal, um, and we can accept additional information. Um, the appeal review board is comprised of the Red Cross and members of the government of PEI. Um, with an EMO specifically. And so that board meets to review uh, the appeal and any additional information has been provided and then a decision is rendered by that board. Okay, a follow-up question to that, Peter? Sure. I have one more on the list. Yeah, thank you. Um, so the appeals board is made up of 
uh, it's a hybrid board, folks from Red Cross Canada and also folks from the provincial government. How, ma how many people sit on the appeals board? Um, there's three right now. Peter Bevan Baker, if you thank, follow up on that. Thank you, Chair. And have they been the same three individuals throughout the course of this program? Yeah, they have. Okay. Okay, and I'm going to go to Hilton McClellan. Oh, thanks, Chair. Can you put me back on in. the chair, please? Um, the, the program is, you say, combined federal and provincial? Like, there's, there's, there's part of it's provincial and part of it's federal? The, the federal government kind of creates the framework for which the provinces can apply that program to their specific circumstances, okay. specific event. So I wouldn't, another way to describe that is, no two provincial disaster financial assistance programs might look alike, depending on the context of the, the event and, and some of the local nuances, like aquaculture, for example. Okay. Um, I guess second one. Or, help me because I didn't ask one. Um, being it's been a year now, is there something that your department sees um, that can be to make it a more effective or more a faster? What would you follow? What would you like to see? I guess that's what I'm trying to say uh, to help. Like I say, it's been a while now. Yeah, Is no. there something we can do? Well, thank you for the, the question, Mr. Chair. And so the uh, uh, Emily gave a bit of an overview of it. I'll, I'll put it over to her again in a moment. But we have been on record, you know, in, in terms of uh, with the federal government and at the request of PEI government to cross this consultation that's been happening across the country for that very conversation to say that. This, it doesn't meet the current the day in terms of the events that are happening, the type, the frequency, uh, everything that's changed within the insurance sector, et cetera. Um, so there are changes that are imperative to be made, um, and, and certainly those are, are underway in terms of the consultation and, and some evolution of the program in and of itself. Uh, Emily herself has actually participated in that, so Emily, I'd offer it over to you if you have something you want to add for maybe further context there. Sure, yeah. So there is um, a, a large effort by the federal government um, to modernize uh, the, the disaster financial assistance programs across Canada. And they've been consulting with provincial and territorial governments. And the Red Cross has also submitted our own recommendations based on what we've seen, um, even just as um, an organization that runs programs concurrent to DFA um, in other provinces. And so some of the things that I think we would, we've been advocating for are that um, because of the, the fact that the program is really based on insurability, which can be um, an, a longer process to sort of um, prove or collect proof for, that there needs to be um, more of a, a focus on damage and loss, which is the impact that people feel, as well as less requirement, right, required documentation. There's a lot of documents that have to be submitted um, for each application. Um, and I'm sure that's part of the frustration that people feel. We certainly hear that and, and we empathize. Um, I think that, you know, having less documentation would benefit, um, you know, everyone. Um, and I, I think we're also just trying to understand or advocate for the fact that um, a, a lot of the programming uh, assumes that you will have completed your repairs or completed your cleanup and then are seeking reimbursement, which for some people can be very challenging financially. And so allowing for um, advances would be something that we'd also be advocating for. Okay, uh, Peter Baden Baker. Thanks. Uh, understanding that changes to the parameters of this program were not made by Red Cross, but those were decisions made by the, somebody in government here. Uh, two changes, uh, significant changes, were made. Uh, one was in the maximum amount that could be applied for. Originally, it was $220,000. And more recently, and I don't know if there were steps in between or not, but recently the figure cited to constituents of mine anyway has been $30,000. Can you confirm that that is indeed what happened? Bill Lawler. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Emily, I'm going to give that to you. I know you participated in those, those discussions. Yeah, so um, there are different maximums depending on the, the type of application, I think. You're referring to residential primarily, and so the maximum um, for residential is two hundred thousand. Um, there is a, a, a different amount um, for cleanup, and I think that's the thirty thousand that you're referring to. So the there the government, you know, um, can provide or can determine different maximums within the overall cap of the program. Um, 
for small business, the overall cap is 220,000 and for not-for-profits is 200,000. Okay. Yeah, thanks, Emily. Uh, I don't think at any point, and I, and I stand to be corrected on this, uh, there was any clarification or anything in writing that the upper limit of 200, and I am talking about resident, these are all constituents in District 17 that I'm speaking on behalf of at the moment, uh, that that 200,000 limit uh, was related to anything specific. In other words, what I'm saying is that the 30,000 for cleanup the way that I interpreted the original figure of 200,000 was that that could be used, all of that money could be used to clean up. Um, uh, am I incorrect in that? Emily? Emily Peter Paolo? There we go. Sorry, on mute. Um, no, you're, you're correct in that. I think is that the program cap is 200,000 and the cleanup cap is 30,000. Um, and so recognizing that um, people might have had also damage in addition to cleanup, then they would be able to potentially access up to the 200,000. If they only had cleanup that they were claiming, then it, it is 30,000. Peter Bethan Baker. Emily, can you point me to the written policy that says that? Because I, I don't think I ever saw that. And certainly a number of my constituents were quite upset when uh, the figure of 30,000 came back and they had had quotes, uh, in one case over 100,000, nobody that went up to 200,000, but I had somebody who had a quote of over $100,000 to clean up their property. Emily Peter Paolo? Um, it is, it's a, we have it in a written document um, that we use to adjudicate files. Um, I'd have to go back and check if it was posted publicly. I don't know offhand. So we'd have to circle back on that. Peter Bethan Baker. Okay, I, thanks, Emily. I, uh, again, I stand to be corrected, and it, maybe it was public, but I've received um, enough concerns from a wide range of constituents that I suspect that it, it was not. None of them had had seen it. Uh, the other criteria which has changed is the end date of the program. It was always September the 30th. And a number of people, and you, you say that 11% of those who put in claims, so that would be around 100,000, uh, sorry, around uh, 1,000 people, are still waiting for an adjudication. Of course, we've passed September 30th now. Can you tell us what the end date for, uh, eligible, uh, for um, money being dispersed is? Emily Peter Pello. Sure. So there, um, I just want to make a distinction that the, the September 30th date was never the end of the program. It was actually the date provided um, for people to finish their cleanup. And so if there is damage or repairs or things like that that are not clean up, they still have additional time. There's no current um, end date for them to finish that work, recognizing that it can be significant and take additional time. Um, the September 30th date was originally set thinking that, um, you know, the cleanup would be done essentially within a year. Um, we understand that there were um, folks who still, whose files are still sitting with us, like you said, the 11% that need more time. Um, and also that there is, um, there's still some challenges around contractors and getting a contractor to come and do the cleanup often. And so um, the, the dates have shifted a little bit. And so now um, if you, not to get in, into the technicalities, but I think that's what you're looking for. Um, if you had received the September 30th date, you now have um, until November 14th to finish the cleanup. And, and this is cleanup done by professional contractors as opposed to yourself and submit the invoice. If you've not received a decision from us as of yet, when you do receive that decision, you'll have 45 days from the date of that letter to complete the cleanup portion of your file. Peter Bevan Baker. This is, I can't tell you how enormously helpful and comforting this is. Um, so it's, so just so I'm clear on this, Emily, the end date for cleanup is actually a little bit elastic. It, it, it's no longer the original date of September the 30th. You mentioned November 14th. However, if you have not received confirmation that, you, that your application is approved, it will be 45 days from the receipt of that letter. Is that correct? Yes, yeah, that's correct. Okay. I can tell you that um, 
a number of my constituents will be very happy to hear that. Let me let me just ask a little bit about the delays in the in the decision making now. Um, the 11 percent who still have not received word. Do you have any sense of how much longer? And I realise some will, you probably some are <laughs> will be decided on today. But how long it will take to finish that entire number that that have not yet received a final decision? Emily Peter Paolo. Yeah, thanks for the question. I think relative to the residential files, which is the vast majority of them, um, in all honesty, the challenge that we have is that um, we're still waiting for information, namely because, again, because of the insur insurability question around this program, we have to wait for um, insurance to make a decision before we can decide on the file. And so I would say that in, in most cases, that's what we're um, what we and the applicants are waiting for. So it's hard to put a timeline on it at this point in time. We are in contact with them. You know, we get regular updates. We ask for updates just to see if things are moving back and forth. Um, but that's, unfortunately, there's no timeline I can put on it. Uh, I'm going to go now to sure. Brad Trevers. No. Uh, Brad Trevers. Well, thank you, Chair. And, and apologies if, I've, if I'm covering off some of the ground that's already been discussed here, but uh, maybe you can even further clarify it. Um, um, my constituents who, uh, you know, are still outstanding or they may be in an appeal phase, um, it seems the crux of the matter is really around uh, what's uninsurable and, and what does that mean. Uh, for example, I have one constituent who has greenhouses and he's, he says, you know, it, it's pretty well known that greenhouses are not insurable and he feels he has definite proof of that, but he was getting denied. Um, and then uh, there's there's the case of uh, you know the underwriting conditions, for example, for barns, which you know he can't can't meet, and he's got proof from insurance companies saying he couldn't meet them. But it's confusing as to to what the, the threshold is. Like does and, and you've alluded to it here, and maybe you can just clarify for me: is the constituent supposed to come with multiple insurance companies saying they won't insure? The, the property or, or what or is it you guys will go to a specific insurance company and that insurance company says it's not insurable or are you going to the federal government I think maybe it's this whole process is, is confusing and and I mean I mean my constituents really feel they have a very very good case some of them for their properties not being insurable I definitely have constituents who you know they had insurable properties they didn't have insurance on, and I'm, I'm not talking about them. These are people who really believe they have a good case, and they're in the appeal process. Um, and so I'll start. I'll start there anyhow. Okay. Emily Peter Paolo. Sure. Yeah. So um, the the sort of analysis of insurability is is what often takes the most amount of time. Um, what we do so as the Red Cross, we have our own insurance team in house that also reviews applications. So. Um, where someone, you know, says that they didn't have insurance, what our insurance team will do is look um, basically at the Canadian insurance market and see if there was any kind of insurance available for that product or for that loss. And I alluded to this a little bit earlier. Um, and to again reiterate, this is because of the parameters and the constraints that we're working within from the, the, the pan-Canadian program, um, where if any insurance product exists for that thing, that they are claiming the loss of, then it is considered insurable in Canada and therefore not eligible to the program. And it's, you know, it's, it's not, I know people are, don't like that answer and it's not what people want to hear, but unfortunately that's the constraint of the program that we're working within. So we do the review. Um, often they have a letter saying, you know, from their insurance company saying, you know, we couldn't insure it because of X, Y, or Z. And we take that into account, um, but we have to look sort of at the whole insurance market across Canada. Bradley Trivers. Uh, so, uh, what I'm hearing is that it's it's uh, every constituent, you know, in preparation for this extreme weather event or future ones, need to look across all of Canada to try and find insurance for their buildings before they can claim to be uninsurable. And and I mean. My constituents, I think, probably went to their insurance company on PEI and they said, yeah, we can't insure it and, and, and stop there, I'm, I'm guessing. But uh, I, I wanted to clarify that first and I wanted to find out if they legitimately, I mean, they thought they could not get insurance on this on this building because they checked around with the insurance companies here on the island. They said, no, 
um, would you award, have you awarded any um, claims that have done that? Or, you know, if there's some place out in, in BC that you can get insurance, then, you know, they, they sorry, you don't get the claim. Uh, Emily Peter Paolo. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that what you're expressing is also, um, I think that we agree that it's not necessarily, um, you know, the most fair analysis, but that is like within the program constraints. Um, we haven't awarded anyone, um, you know, who, like any files that have, in, you know, couldn't get the insurance and, you know, we see or whatever. So I think that we've provided the same, we've done the same analysis in every single file. Um, generally, the one caveat to insurability is storm surge, um, where um, and uh, overland flood, which those are harder insurance products to obtain. Um, you know, often you can't get them; um, they're not considered, you know, widely affordable or available in Canada. And so um, that's separate and distinct of like home insurance or standard commercial business insurance. Brad Trivers. So, I mean, obviously I'm not an insurance expert by any means, and I would, I would say that uh, the vast majority, if not all the people trying to claim through this program are not insurance uh, experts, but it seems to be widely circulated that, for example, greenhouses are uninsurable, and I'm not talking about uh, uh, storm surge or things like that. Is, that. is that simply a myth? Are you telling me that in most cases greenhouses are insurable? Emily Peter Paolo. Um, I mean, I'm not an insurance expert either, so I can't confirm for sure, you know, if they're insurable or not. What I would say is that there's also different types of greenhouses and that often factors into the analysis. Um, and so this is where we rely on our insurance team to look at the type of greenhouse um, that it was and, you know, if an, if an insurance product was available for that type of greenhouse. So I don't know that we can broadly say they are all insurable or all uninsurable. As with insurance, um, like everyone's policy is different. I don't think you would find any two policies that are the same and that's what becomes challenging. So we have to do the analysis in a way that would um, ensure that there's you know equal treatment of files across all of them. Uh, I'm gonna allow a follow-up question for yeah, Brad Rivers. So, so basically, you're, it, it, one way of interpreting this, and I would say some of my constituents would, is that um, they got bad advice about insurance, and they didn't have the, you know, the, the knowledge to go and pursue across Canada insurance, and now so now they're left in a position where they thought they had an uninsurable building, and they can't get the supports. Is that is that sort of what you're saying, Emily Peter Paolo? I mean, I think, I, I don't know if they got, you know, bad advice. I mean, they'd have to talk to their own broker. I think it's just to say that, um, you know, if they tried to get insurance um, and maybe they, you know, had asked um, other, you know, if they would broker other providers, there could have been a product potentially. But again, it depends on the specific, you know, the type of, you know, for that example, the greenhouse, what it's used for all of those things factor in. So I don't know if they, if they got good advice or bad advice. I think it's just, again, it's the analysis of like what other products is that exist on the market. Uh, before I go to Peter Bevan Baker, I just have a few questions, so maybe for, for Bill. But uh, my understanding is, is that the province contributed $1.5 million of core funding to Red Cross to uh, administer this disaster relief funding. Uh, and I think there was a formula that if there was future calls or future issues, there was sort of an add-on to that. Um, so I'm looking at the numbers here and saying that you had 3,370 applications, you have 900 approved, and you have 11% remaining. So that means you have 330 more applications to go through. One of the big complaints that I got in my district, and mostly from the aquaculture industry, was it's taken so long to get, they put an application in by the deadline, and uh, then they get the answer that they're not covered. It, how, did you go through a process to make sure that you could kind of weed out the ones that uh, were all, right off the bat probably not eligible and so they could be informed? Because that's what the aquaculture industry guys are telling me is that they're left with this unknown. They're, I'm assuming they're part of the 330 remaining, uh, but it, it puts them in a terrible spot to get an answer back, whether it's approved or not approved or whether we, they could appeal or not. So maybe you could shed some light on how many people were you putting on this, and did you do a process where you weeded out 
applications that probably weren't eligible fairly quickly, and the remaining ones, probably the odds are that they're going to uh, uh, be approved. But, or was it just random? We just started from one and went to 3,370. Yeah. No, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll, I'll frame this up a little bit, and I'm sure Emily will have things to contribute as well. But so first and foremost, whenever we you know design and try to determine how we could uh, support such an operation, uh, it's an estimate, right? She's still Oh, I can see her on my screen, but you can't see her on that screen. Over here. Oh. Um, well, it's working over there. Oh, okay. Yeah. okay. Sorry. No, no trouble. So um, it's an estimate as to, you know, we have no idea how many applications we're going to receive or claims, um, and certainly in the duration and the complexity of them. So there's some estimates. Uh, it's in, similar to, you know, the answering an earlier question of when will they be finished, it's, it's almost impossible to determine when they be finished. The one thing, though, I would also add is that uh, in your opening uh, question or comment around the, the 1.5 million is that our support to the province of PEI is also eligible for recovery from through the province. So our direct support um, in terms of uh, it not being an additional expense exclusively to the PEI. They are able to submit that for reimbursement as well oh. for cost recovery. In terms of, so, and then when, when we began the process, uh, Emily and the team built up a local capacity to have uh, people here on the ground in our Charlottetown office and, and roaming to make sure that there were several community uh, meetings that took place uh, throughout the island. Um, to try to provide a little bit of a, you know, DFA 101, and this is some of the things that you should be looking for and, and help. And so then as the cases started to come in, this is a cross sector now at this point, um, determined do we have the right capacity to handle that influx of, of uh, claims coming in. As the claims start to go down, then we would reduce, you know, our expenses because they would, we wouldn't need that much capacity to, to process and have the meetings with individual, whether they be uh, uh, residential or commercial or agriculture, what have you. Um, and then in terms of, you know, there's, as Emily noted in her overview, you know, unfortunately the aquaculture sector is a very complicated component of DFA. So there's a lot of dialogue that happens, not just with the uh, applicant or the claimant and the Red Cross, but also the province and also the federal government. So there's this, you know, myriad of, of conversations that take place to determine what can be done with this. And, and Emily, again, I know you've participated in some of that, so I'll give the broad overview, but if you have anything more specific you'd like to uh, offer to the uh, chair, please go ahead. Uh, Emily, sure. Peter Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, so in terms of the sort of like the weeding out, um, yes, we did do that. And so, but it relied on having complete applications. So if there was any documentation missing, um, or anything like that, then um, we weren't able to look at that file right away and do that weeding out process. But there were, for example, um, many applications that didn't, for example, have like photos, which is required to show sort of proof of the loss. Um, we did offer opportunities. We followed up several times with each of those applicants to see if they wanted to provide that information or not. And if they didn't, then we would close the file. So we did also provide people opportunities after the application deadline to keep submitting documents that were missing, um, recognizing that, you know, the application deadline, although the application period was about four months, it still always, you know, um, throws people off right at the end and they are, you know, scrambling to gather things. So we allowed the opportunity for people to submit afterwards. Um, and where people haven't heard, um, so like the 11% that we still have, for example, it's because those are more complex and require more analysis um, to, to, you know, to determine eligibility. And probably, unfortunately, some of them won't be eligible once analysis is done, but we have to, again, you know, apply the same, the same review to every single application. So I'll just to recap so like that a bit is that, so of the 330 remaining, they, how many of them would have incomplete files for, from what your perspective is? Is all 330 complete and it's just a matter of you doing your analysis or is it a case of uh, they have to get back to you with more information? Just to give me a, some broad strokes to, to get an idea where we're going to finish this up at, whether it'll be done by the new year or not. So would half of, the, half of them still have outstanding information they require you or is it, and the other half are just information that you're, you haven't analyzed yet, if that's a better way of w wording it. Um, it's, you know, I don't have the numbers offhand, so we can certainly follow up, but it's probably a combination. Um, some of them, uh, for sure, were waiting on documentation. So I referenced earlier the ones who were, you know, for example, waiting on their insurance companies to make a determination on the file. Um, there are others who are still collecting quotes and things like that from contractors to be able to submit them um, for repairs, things like that. 
there's the other ones where we're waiting on damage assessments to come back um, to fully understand what the damage was. So we can follow up with a percentage if that's what you're looking for. I don't know it offhand, though. I would appreciate that, or our committee would at some point. Peter Bevan Baker. Thanks, Chair. Um, first thing, I want to thank Brad for digging down on that issue. Um, it, I think it was like two or three days after Fiona and I met with uh, a farmer in my district whose uh, greenhouses were absolutely destroyed. And as far as I know, they did receive uh, compensation. Now, whether that was through their insurer or not, I don't know. But I'm going to, I'm going to. I didn't hear from them consequently, so my guess is that they did. So I'm, I'm. I'd love to speak with you off. Sorry, I'm using committee time to kind of send a personal <laughs> message to Brad. Trying to get questions here yeah, to the But I, I just wanted to thank him for digging down on that. Um, I just want to because the biggest concern I have had are people who think that the deadline has passed, they, they have not heard back whether they are eligible or not. And I just want to, again, be absolutely clear that the clock on, the, on the, those that have not yet, a decision has not yet been made, the clock does not start ticking that 45 days until the letter arrives, yes or no. Uh, I, I mean, the letter being yes or no. Emily Peter Palo. Yeah, that's correct. So until they get that letter from us, um, then you know the, the clock doesn't start counting down. Great. Again, if they've received a letter already, then they've already been informed of an extension um, to that November 14th date. For Again, this is just for cleanup. So I just want to be clear that this is not like a, an end program date right. uh, by any means. This is specific to cleanup. Right. Peter Bevenbecker. Is there um, a cap on the amount of money sitting in the pot available? Emily Peter Paolo? Uh, no, there's no cap that I'm aware of. Um, the, because it's a reimbursement based program where um, the province will, uh, once we're done all the files, the province will submit um, a claim essentially to the federal government for reimbursement. I don't believe that there's a claim, um, but uh, we'd have to confirm a, or a cap on the claim. I don't believe that there is. Because remembering too, we're administering the private sector component of DFA. There's also a component of DFA um, that's being administered by the government of PEI themselves for municipalities um, as well to submit their own costs related to Fiona response. Peter Bevenbaker. Thanks. And again, I, I asked the question because uh, I've had a couple of folks concerned that if they are the one of the last to be there, will there be money left? And I wanted to know that um, a decision that folks will be approved based on the validity of their claim rather than the fact that there's money left or not left in the pot and you've just said that yes it will be based on the validity of their claim i thank you thank you for that um can i just also confirm something about uh homeowners clearly were eligible if they met the criteria tenants were also eligible is that correct again if they met the criteria yeah, tenant, tenants are eligible to meet the criteria. Um, I will say that um, there's, you know, for tenants, for example, um, for cleanup, it would depend on if they had a lease that said that they were responsible for the cleanup versus their landlord. So there's still nuance, but they are eligible if they meet all the requirements. Yeah, I just, and, and that's exactly the, and I realize we're digging down in, in detail on a particular part of the policy here, Emily, but it's really important, and I'm, this is for a specific constituent, uh, a tenant who um, was denied. And the criteria, as I, I mean, if, if you read the written criteria, is that the, you need to present either a lease agreement or um, another document indicating that this is your current address. And there's nothing there that says that it must be a lease agreement or, and this is in the written criteria for the provincial DFAP. Um, um, that they need to have a lease agreement that actually stipulates that they need to be the one maintaining the property. Can you point me to where I can find that particular policy? I'm, I'm going to remind that I remember this is the Natural Resources Committee. Now, you could be referring to a tenant who's renting a barn, so maybe I'll allow that question, but I will allow the question yeah. to be answered. But I just want to clarify that we are the Natural Resources Committee pertaining to Red Cross. If we're getting into apartments and tenancy, that's not necessarily our area. But the question could apply to a farmer who was renting a barn, as an example. Uh, so I'll, I'll allow the question. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I think we'll have to get back to you on that, because I don't know exactly where it is. But we can circle back and add that 
uh, when we submit a written uh, follow-up. I want to intervene on a question here too, just quickly. One of the issues I also had from mostly the aquaculture industry again was the issue of contacting Red Cross to find out when's my application going to be updated and things of that nature or a decision made. Uh, most of them had. So is there a process that people had when they contacted Red Cross to try to get an update on their application? So that would apply to aquaculture in any, any situation, I'm sure. But maybe you could provide some information on the, the feedback on updates uh, for applicants. And yeah, no, thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Chair. And, and uh, Emily, you'll, you'll provide more for sure. But um, certainly we, we did, as I mentioned, we, we had a local capacity and local staff who were you know, assigned to the various uh, claimants that were coming in. Um, and in some cases, um, they would come into the office or they would make phone calls and, and follow up uh, as appropriate. Um, again, it's, a, it's, it's also a part of the, uh, uh, the many moving pieces within each file. And as much as we can appreciate a claimant, regardless of sector, who, but particularly with the aquaculture sector, we, we appreciate the, the pain points within yes. that particular sector, um, that it would take longer than it would be desired. Um, and not to, uh, in any stretch, uh, alleviate that uh, constraint of time that has been imposed upon everyone who's applying. As, as Emily had alluded to, over on the overall, it's actually the, the rate at which claims have gone through and been processed has been faster here on the island than others. That does nothing for someone who's no, still waiting for an answer, to be fair. Uh, but on the overall, just to give a, a, the broader context of the picture of that. But Emily, would you like to talk about in terms of any uh, triage or follow up with the uh, a claimant within the aquaculture sector in terms of how they would know where they're at in the process? Yeah, so there's, uh, I mean, there's different ways you can get in contact with us. Um, you know, they can contact the local office where our team sits. We also have a remote team working on this program, so they can email us. They can also call the call center. Um, the call center agents can't provide specific details on a case, but they can notify the team that someone has called to inquire. We also regularly get um, requests for information. I think people are, are also still calling EMO. Um, or aquaculture directly within the government of PEI. And so we're providing that information back to our government counterparts um, when those um, concerns or questions come in. I don't know if that answers your question exactly. Well, I, yeah, for mine, I just wanted to get on the record of the people who are inquiring saying they're having a difficult time reaching out to Red Cross or getting a response back. So that, that's all. I just want to know that there was a specific process. Uh, back to Peter Bevan Baker. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'd just like to ask a little bit about the Canadian Red Cross costs associated with this. And you talked a little bit about this, Emily, in your uh, initial presentation. Um, do you have a, and I realize it can't be a final figure because we're not done yet, but do you have an up-to-date figure of what the administrative costs anyway. incurred by Canadian Red Cross are? Uh, I wouldn't have that uh, uh, member and yeah. Mr. Chair uh, available to us uh, today. It is a, an ongoing uh, update for sure. Um, Emily, I'm, I'm not sure if you would have anything uh, more accurate, but I know it's, it's, it's a, a continuously moving target. No, I don't have a specific number right now, no. Okay. Chair. Peter Baden Baker. Yeah, can you give us a sense of uh, uh, there's been 7.6 million committed. Some, some of it's already been expanded, and I think 2.2, you said, is committed, ready to go. Extrapolating from that, we'll probably be up around 10 million by the time it's finished. What what is a typical percentage of um, the costs which are incurred for administration? Is it 10 percent? Is it 20 percent? In previous disaster financial assistance administration. In terms of the overall, um, just, I want just to clarify the question, if I may. Sure. What is the percentage of administration applied to the service agreement, essentially? Is that what you're, you're Yeah, well, what's a typical, uh, let's say that $10 million is expended, should we, should we expect that the administration of that would be 10%, say, a million dollars, or is it awesome. higher than that? Uh, so there's the, the way that the service agreement is, is framed, and I'm, I'm going from memory here, but so there's a, a service fee or administration fee for the, I'll say, the direct work that we do. So in terms of the, the staffing that are supporting directly the claimants and any types of those direct costs that would be there. Um, and that is typically, and I don't know if you can do it from memory, I, I don't remember the service agreement by heart. Um, and then there's another threshold for, so it's not the same as what I'm trying to, to suggest that for the direct cost and the indirect cost. And so the indirect cost would be the, the flow through, right? So we're, we have the, the funds and we provide them to the applicant based on the whole approval process. There's, there are differences in terms of that uh, administrative structure. And I, I, 
Forgive me, uh, member. I, I don't sure. know what it is off the top. Okay. Peter Bevan Baker. Um, and I don't. Maybe Emily, the, having been around and um, doing this kind of work for thirty years, could give us the sort of a, what a typical percentage would be for previous disaster financial assistance plans. Emily Peter Paolo. I, you know, I don't know offhand. I think um, we can certainly loop back. Um, the the other program we did, as I said, was for Hurricane Dorian. And so we can certainly provide that information afterwards, but I don't know off the top of my head. Okay. All right, Peter Bevan Baker. Right. And my last question, I think, is regarding the uh, appeal. Um, the, the appeals decision is final and, and cannot be uh, appealed further, which is, I'm sorry, my, my apologies. Um, the, can you tell us the reason for that? Bill Lawler. Uh, uh, actually, over to uh, to you, Emily. Your appeal experience. Um, the, and sorry, just to clarify, the reason why um, the appeal board decision is final and can't be appealed again. Yeah, I, 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 again, I'm referring to a couple of constituents who have uh, been in regular contact with me about their cases. One has reached a final appeal and they really feel that they, that they have a strong case and having sat down with them and looked through the, their paperwork, I have to concur with them. But they're not able to, uh, they appealed the original decision and the second decision came back, which they now no longer can appeal. Um, and I'm just wondering if there is any, well, I guess another way of putting the question, is there any other recourse for these individuals, perhaps outside this program? Uh, Emily Peter Paolo. I can't speak if there's any recourse outside the program. I think that would be a question better suited maybe for the, the government of PEI. I think for the Appeal Review Board, um, again, because the government sets out the parameters that we're working within, um, that was the decision is that everyone gets one opportunity to appeal. And if it does go you know, to the Appeal Review Board, then that decision is final. Um, there is no uh, reappeal possible, unfortunately, through the DFA program. Peter, what, is this something I'll, I'll mention? So maybe it pertains, I know Hilt brought it up around the uh, uh, Apple industry where the, they didn't qualify for certain things and then there was an arrangement between the federal and provincial government to do provide some supports for damages to improve their Apple industry. So that's kind of a another thing that was done in response to the fact that the disaster relief uh, didn't support uh, that industry. I think that would be a fair way of describing it. I hope I'm in fair with that. Uh, be yeah, no, Mr. Chair, and for all members, it, some of the, generally speaking, when some of the issues have come up that uh, would likely to result in, in eligibility, uh, what Emily and the team will do is they'll, when they discuss that with the provincial government, and then they'll often advocate for it. This is something that should be. And again, speaking right. very broad uh, to this uh, for consideration. In some cases, that would be, and we have experiences where that has been approved, and others not, because ultimately that decision rests uh, elsewhere outside of our organization. But, but just to make sure that, you know, we, yes, we do have to work within the parameters, but if we see something that's, you know, determined that something needs to be done here, we will advocate as much as we can as an organization. Uh, to try to change that that decision. Okay, thanks. Peter Bevan Baker. Yeah, I, I, and that was really my final question, but I, I'm when you receive the uh, final review done by the Appeals Review Board, um, there are no signatures attached to that. It's just on, on behalf of the Review Board. And you mentioned that there are three individuals who've been on that Appeals Board since the beginning. Is there a reason why their identity is not, like why they don't sign that personally? Uh, Bill Lawler. Yeah, I, again, uh, not being uh, individually on that particular board, I, I don't know if that ever came up, Emily, in, in your discussion. It strikes me that that would be a, a departmental question for public safety, but Emily, do you have any insights uh, to that? No, I don't, unfortunately. I think that would be a departmental question um, since they set out the, the parameters for that review board. So is that your final question, or do you want to follow up to that, uh, Peter? Uh, no, I... I, I... I won't ask Emily or, or Bill to, to suggest who those people are, but I will certainly look further in, within the department. Thank you. I appreciate all of your answers today. Thank now you. that concludes my uh, running list of questions. If there's anybody else, uh, speak now or forever hold your peace. Uh, anyway, with that, I want to thank uh, Bill and uh, Emily. I, actually, I find that this has been somewhat enlightening to uh, know the processes a little more and get a little more clarity. And I think it's important that Red Cross has provided some sort of an update. Uh, and, uh, you know, maybe I could uh, criticize government for maybe it should have uh, 
taken the initiative to try to update Islanders a little more uh, effectively in that, but I do appreciate your time and coming in, and I do apologize for some of the issues we run into with the fire alarms and the uh, issues that were beyond our control, but I thank you very much for that. And I guess we'll take a small recess while we allow Bill to leave, and we'll get on to our final item on the agenda, which is new business, which we do have a few little items to bring up. Thank you for this opportunity, and thanks for your patience with Emily on the screen and, and oh. me here in the room. I appreciate the opportunity. Thanks very much. Okay. Small recess while Bill steps out. and. We'll see if we can get people back in the chamber. <coughs> committee meeting and I just to inform everyone that uh, Brad Trivers is now sitting in as a voting member uh, on the committee uh, to replace uh, Jamie uh, so we have quorum. Um, anyway okay the next item on our agenda is new business and I did have uh, one uh, Peter Bevan Baker brought up uh, the issue about uh, uh, the Forestry Commission is a PEI Forestry Commission Thank you, Chair. <coughs> and that. so I'll, you, you can shed some light on the Certainly. issue. Uh, I mean, we had a great conversation yesterday, and I appreciated uh, particularly Kate Macquarie's contribution to that. A um, lot of interesting information, new data. Uh, and very recently, the Forestry Commission, and she actually uh, referred to them a couple of times in her presentation yesterday, they have produced their interim report, not final report. And uh, <coughs> I would like to invite Jean-Paul Arsenault, who is the chair of the Forestry Commission, to come in and, and give us uh, a sense of what, I, th I think it would complement what Kate Macquarie said and uh, also fit, as Alicia mentioned earlier when we were chatting about this, uh, with a potential visit to the Frank Goody uh, site. So. Okay, committee, uh, anybody, uh, well, I guess obviously some issues are right in front of us as uh, we do have a tight agenda, so incorporating that uh, Meeting might be difficult in the immediate, but I think you are referring to after the city of Spring the would be fine, as an example. Sure. So, so uh, is everybody kind of in agreement? And it might, uh, I think somebody suggested the Frank Goody Nursery, so maybe we could have the meeting out there or as, as a possibility or whatever. But I, once again, we'll leave in the trusty hands of Alicia. She's done a great job of coordinating some of our uh, meetings so far, and uh, I, I have the utmost confidence in her in uh, fulfilling this one as well. So, we can add it to our agenda and take it from there. Any other new business? Seeing none, can I call for an adjournment and try to have everybody have a good weekend? Adjourned by, can Brad Trivers, yeah, he's uh, sitting here. Yeah. Meeting adjourned. <laughs>